Hello, it's Kevin Annett. Uh, I'm going to read a number of reflections and short readings from my uh, new book, Unrelenting, Between Sodom and Zion. People have requested that I actually share more of the, the spirit and the substance of these things, besides the bare fact that it's out now, along with Murder by Decree. So I'm going to uh, actually read a couple of reflections based on formative experiences that led to my whole um, involvement with Native people and then this long odyssey to uh, to expose genocide in Canada. For me it began when I was 31. I was a seminarian a theology student in Vancouver and I went on an exchange kind of a fact-finding mission down to Mexico to the Mayan refugee camps in Chiapas. April 1987, Chiapas, Mexico. They were like me, undeterred by their own misery, only there were thousands of them. They struggled and starved together in a refugee camp, devoted to each other, and so unmarked by greed. For they knew that they were in a war to the death. The smallest of them took my hand in his own, unmindful of his rickety legs and half-blinded eyes. He led me into the world and gave me a full belly and a fuller heart when I thought that I was to be his helper. I stopped wearing a watch that day. It suddenly seemed wrong, like a dead part of me I wanted to shed. After all, time is simultaneous to the Mayans, not our linear arrow. After Chiapas, I learned to live only in the moments that mattered. I stood in the refugee camp at the center of everything and of all time with a young dying boy and learned of his life from an interpreter, as dozens of other thin, laughing children descended on our little pale group and troubled us beyond belief, for we all had to make a choice that day. A handful of black beans and some fly-covered scrambled eggs, a deep, searching look from a child's guileless eyes, an invitation by the refugees themselves to take life away from that child by eating these, the only eggs in the entire camp, the best they could offer to their guests. I learned that day that Zabalba is the eater of human souls and every moment of life is a testing by him. Maybe he's the entity who made an offer to Jesus in a desert as broiling as the Nueva Esperanza refugee camp. For the tester came to me that day and urged me to see the choice as one reducible to my own personal morality. The other one who gives us life more than life watched me through my little Mayan friend's gaze with the same precise look others have turned on me over the years when they helped consecrate me into this moment. But Zabalba had the upper hand just then. Turn these rocks into tortillas if you are one of Christ's, it spoke to me, as I gazed at the meal prepared from us from out of the dwindling camp supplies that should have gone to the hundred or more children who died there every month. Feed yourself by giving this food to the starving children and dine on your pride of having done the right thing. It hissed at me through my heart. Are you, Kevin, not the means to make this world better? An angel intervened just then, as I was about to yield. The rough hands of the Mexican interpreter brought me to the rough wooden table and bade me sit and eat the children's only food. I ate, and I honored the people according to their ancient custom on their terms and not on mine. And the tempter departed from me for a while. Flowing from that, there's a, another reflection I call Two Heads as One, and it was taken from a story told to me by Nelson Keatley, who was a New Chelneth elder when I ministered in Port Alberni. Two Heads as One. The people had lived on the land they were to lose for untold epochs, and their wisdom was of that land itself. But nothing had prepared them for their own obliteration at the hands of what their surviving legends called the two-headed serpent. The monster appeared outside a village of the people soon after pale invaders had swept onto their land. The serpent spoke not with one voice, but with two. One head uttered friendly, soothing sounds and offered to help the people. The other head hissed and threatened to destroy them. The villagers were confused as to what voice to believe. They finally asked their shaman for advice. The wise old man stared at the serpent for a while and finally said, This white thing is a strange and crazy animal. It'll never make any sense because it has two minds. One is gentle and the other is hateful. One head does not know the other, but each thinks it's the only head. It has to be sent away or killed or it'll destroy us all. 
but the people were compassionate. They took pity on the confused creature and tried to cure it of its craziness. They welcomed it into their village. Years later, a young man who was the sole survivor of the massacre told others what had happened in order to warn them about the thing with two minds and two heads. The serpent lived among us for a time and then it attacked us without warning. The day it struck, our best warriors tried to kill it, but our weapons were useless against it. The serpent was much too strong, but that was not the worst of it. What was more terrible was that once the serpent ate one of the people, that person emerged from the serpent with two heads as well, and it helped the serpent destroy the rest of our people. Soon our world was filled with many creatures with two heads, for everyone had become crazy, just like the pale invaders. We and our forebearers, as the official representatives of the one we call Jesus Christ, used not only love, schools, and Bibles, but smallpox, guns, and rape to spread our message of peace and love. But as one of those born of the two-headed people, I have the advantage bestowed by civilization of ignoring the troubling image in the mirror. I will be reading more, especially concerning the uh, Mohawk people and the dig I conducted there with their permission and authorization. And this regalia was in fact given to me by the Mohawks as part of that back in 2011 and 2012. Stay tuned.